Welcome to our 2022 FMI Faculty Data Blitz. I'm Melissa Barnett. I'm the director of the Francis McClelland Institute for Children, Youth, and Families, or FMI, as we call ourselves. We are thrilled that you could join us today. Here is a brief overview of what we're planning to do today. Um, and we will keep everything brief. That is the theme for the day. So although we're joining virtually, I do think it's important to acknowledge where our institution, University of Arizona, um, resides. And so I'd like to share the land acknowledgement that was developed with the University of Arizona in partnership with the tribal representatives. We respectfully acknowledge the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Aotham and the Yaki. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships, and community service. Here at the Francis McClelland Institute, our goal is to build family resilience through working in partnerships so that children and youth from disadvantaged backgrounds have the opportunity to thrive. We do this by supporting innovative research, actively partnering with community organizations, sharing research findings with practitioners and the community, and educating the next generation of engaged scholars and leaders. All of the work that we do is in the honor of Francis, the honor of the legacy of Francis McClelland, who lived a life that demonstrated, facilitated, and celebrated resilience in others. Beyond being a great philanthropist and staunch advocate for children, youth, and families, Francis also believed in the power of research to transform lives. And today um, we will, um, next Dr. Laura Scarmella will give a brief introduction and then we'll move right into our presentations. We're so thrilled to have um, nine faculty presenting today. And you can see we have some diversity in, in the units that, that presenters are coming from. Each presenter will present for five minutes. We will be timing and we will, if you see someone abruptly cut off, that's because they've reached the limit and then we'll move on to the next person. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing about all of the great work that my colleagues have been doing. So I'm going to stop sharing now and we will let um, Dr. Scarmella give an introduction and then it'll be followed by Dan McDonald's presentation. Thank you. Um, welcome everyone. I feel like it's a big, <laughs> there, there's pressure on to have a great introduction. No, I'm super excited to have you all here. This is a fun time for me because um, as many of you know, my academic home is in family studies, but I don't get to do a whole lot of research anymore. So it's great opportunity for me to get caught up on what everybody's doing and really truly see the truly exciting uh, and groundbreaking research that's happening. So um, I'm looking forward to the event and welcome. Sorry about that. I'm going to go faster, I promise you. <laughs> I just couldn't find my unmute button after I shared. Okay, here we go. Here's my presentation. Is this going to go? Oh, God sakes, there we go. Okay. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Dan McDonald, director of the Take Charge America Institute. Um, we focus on financial education and research, and I'm going to highlight a few of the projects that we're working on currently. Um, first of all, um, how do children learn about money? How do parents teach uh, their children about money? Uh, that's called financial socialization or financial parenting. And TCAI, TCAI along with Cooperative Extension, re recently launched a new initiative using children's literature to teach lessons to children ages three to five years old about money. So it's knowing the difference between needs and wants, making comparisons, learning numeracy, and that type of thing, building blocks to understanding uh, money and our behaviors around money. We just completed a pilot study of this um, project. Our next steps are to um, um, make those changes that we learned about, um, scale up, do an actual evaluation of the effectiveness of the program, which hopefully leads to an actual research project um, um, on the children's ability for, um, to learn skills around numeracy and readiness for school. Okay. 
uh, I'm fumbling because I have to go so fast. Uh, TCAI also supports uh, research projects uh, within the Norton School on financial literacy. Our current project we are working on is financial capability study, um, uh, which includes data collected over every three years by the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority otherwise known as FINRA. So TCAI also has opportunities for graduate students to assist with literature reviews on topics related to financial literacy programming. We wanna learn what works, what doesn't work. One of the oldest programs with TCAI is the Take Charge Cats. This is a near peer financial education program where undergraduate students from the U of A teach middle, high school and college students about financial literacy. We are revamping our evaluation on this particular program. And one of the interesting things we'd really like to take a look at is how are our undergraduate students who have been part of this program um, um, learning from it? How is it affecting their own um, financial literacy behaviors? Um, if you are interested in any of these projects, and I went over them very quickly, um, you can get in touch with me. Fortunately, I'll have more time to um, speak with our prospective graduate students um, later on in the afternoon. I can go into more detail and explain what I just fumbled through. But thank you very much. I'll stop sharing. under five minutes. So that was impressive, Dan. Okay. Open up. And sorry, it's not one of, here we go. Okay. So I want to start off by talking about the two things that really drive my research agenda. And the first thing is poverty. In we really can think about poverty as a developmental toxin in that exposure to poverty increases the risks across every single domain of child health and development we can think of. And poverty is not equally distributed in our society. Young children are especially likely to experience poverty. And because poverty is so closely linked to racism and discrimination and other forms of oppression, find that children of color are especially likely to be exposed to poverty related stressors. On the other hand, we know that participating in supportive early relationships with their caregivers provide really critical foundations for positive development, including social, behavioral, and cognitive development that really resonate across the lifespan. And these supportive relationships may be most critical and yet most threatened for children exposed to poverty and other stresses. But many young children from disadvantaged backgrounds thrive, and that's because they've had the opportunity to be exposed to these resilient processes, what's been termed ordinary magic, these protective systems, and in particular in my research, I'm interested in understanding these protective early supportive relationships. And I look at these relationships with four different types of caregivers in my work, mothers, fathers, grandmothers, and early childhood educators, and I'm going to focus on those last two groups today. So I'm interested in understanding what factors are linked to um, interacting with children in these supportive ways in these caregiving relationships, how participating in these relationships is linked to children's development, and increasingly my work is focusing on the relationships among these caregivers. So what we may think of as co-parenting within the family or more generally co-caring relationships, how those are linked to child development directly and indirectly through those direct interactions with children. And so turn first just quickly to talk about grandparents. We know that grandparents often play key supportive roles for parents and children, especially in economically disadvantaged communities. And this involvement may bring multi-generational advantages and disadvantages. But we really know shockingly little about what this level of grandparent involvement means in terms of the well-being for multiple generations in the family. To try to address some of these gaps, my colleagues and I launched an online study a couple of years ago to figure out what self-identified caregiving grandparents are doing and how they're perceiving the well-being of themselves and their family. And one of the sort of salient findings that's emerging across analyses in this work 
is really this idea that those for those grandparents who are living in multi-generational households seem to be experiencing the greatest risk in terms of their own well-being, their perception of their grandchildren's development, and their relationships with their with the middle generation. And so this we wonder why. Um, and we've actually launched a new survey, just, just launched it to try to get some of these um, really delve into the family processes in these households. So stay tuned for the data that's next year when I hope to be able to answer that. Um, moving on then to my work with early childhood education teachers, I'm going to talk quickly about two secondary data analysis studies with the same collaborators, both looking at nationally representative samples of children participating in Head Start. The, in the first study, we were interested in understanding the, um, the differences that, that children might experience in terms of the overall quality of, of support in the, the classroom or the global level, the kind of climate, and their individual relationships with teachers. And we found there's quite a lot of variability. Some children have quality at, at both levels, some have a mismatch, some have low quality at both levels. And one of, I think, the most important and interesting findings I've been involved in in the last couple of years is the fact that teachers who reported the highest levels of their personal psychological distress were either in the profile with the highest quality at both levels or the lowest quality at both levels, which I think is really important in terms of uh, recent conversations around the early childhood workforce. And lastly, we're currently working on analyses where we're trying to understand how Head Start centers and families build partnerships together to work together and how that's related to children's, um, children's school readiness. Ultimately, I'm going to bring these strands of research together so that we can understand how participating in all of these different relationships is linked to children's development so we can figure out how we can collectively support children and their caregivers, especially those children who are exposed to significant stressors associated with poverty. And finally, thank you to my long list of collaborators and funders. Okay. Hey everybody, I'm Russ Toomey. Um, I use he and they pronouns, and I'm going to move us into adolescence uh, from Melissa Barnett's um, overview. Um, so my um, my research really is driven by uh, the theoretical lens of minority stress and resilience, um, as well as intersectionality. And my research um, vision, the, the the reason I do my research is to end suicide disparities uh, that emerge. Uh, due to gender identity expression as well as sexual orientation. Um, and so importantly, my research is framed from the idea and the theoretical lens that disparities are driven by oppression rather than innate, innate of the, the person, um, that these structural uh, oppressions at the state, um, government, cultural level impact everyday interpersonal um, uh, minority stress experiences, whether that's discrimination, bias, uh, as well as the internalization of those processes. Um, and our, my research and my research with my colleagues uh, aims to inform policy practice and programming uh, to try to end minority stress experiences and ultimately, again, the disparities that are driven by those. And so uh, it's kind of a loop where my work uh, ultimately informs prevention, tests prevention, and then goes back to the beginning to look at how can we then address structural oppression. So I'm gonna provide three snapshots kind of where I'm at in my research and, and the three varying kinds of research um, projects that I engage in, uh, ranging from landscape surveys to structural change interventions to individual level interventions. So first, uh, my research um, currently, I'm in, in the field, quote unquote, uh, uh, gathering survey data. Uh, I partnered with the Human Rights Campaign Foundation, as well as a colleague at the University of Florida. And we're conducting the first ever national study of parents and caregivers of transgender and gender diverse youth. Um, as of this morning, we already have 1,500 parents and caregivers across the country who have completed our survey. Um, and it's really exciting because um, we know an emerging amount of, of data um, talks about the experiences of trans kids and gender diverse kids, usually from adolescents perspectives or young adults perspectives reflecting back, but we actually know very little about the parents and caregivers that are actually, you know, in those day to day moments, whether they're advocating at schools, working with medical professionals or legal professionals, 
um, and, and helping to provide a safe um, and supportive context for their kids. Um, so stay tuned to next year uh, to, to find some of the, um, the preliminary results from that study. A second um, area that I focus on is um, structural change. And so I have funding from the NCAA uh, and we're in the field in this as well. Uh, we're testing a pilot intervention um, to change the culture of, of collegiate ath uh, athletics to make it more inclusive of LGBTQ people, players, um, fans, coaches, et cetera. Um, so again, that's in the works. Um, we'll have data by the end of the summer, um, at least preliminary on how well our intervention works to create safer cultures. And then finally, uh, because we can't just wait for structural level change, that takes a long time. And so part of my research also focuses on individual level interventions around coping. And so um, a really exciting project uh, that was in the field a couple of years ago um, is called Mapping Q. And it's a collaboration with the Mu Museum of Art at the U of A, uh, where we bring in LGBTQ youth. They learn art making skills as well as suicide prevention skills. Um, and through this program, we actually documented some pretty um, moderately sized decreases in things like depressive symptoms from the beginning to the end of the program. Um, so very exciting ways to intervene at all of these varying levels. So I think I'm probably out of time. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to do this. I'll say this is just as much of a treat for us to get to learn about the other panelists. I have a lot of collaboration I want to do as a result of the first few presentations. Um, my name is Debbie Curley, and I am an extension agent with Cooperative Extension, which is the outreach arm of the university within um, the College of Ag and Life Sciences. And I'm in the Pima County office, and I run a program called the Family Engagement Program. The underlying research concept behind a lot of what we do in the family engagement program is that 90% of a child's brain is developed by the time they're five years old. Um, this graphic, which is um, used a lot by our uh, primary funder, which is First Things First, um, really illustrates that when a child is born, um, they are really open to a lot of the neuronal development and, um, and brain growth. Um, of the first five years and that by the time that they're six, you've got all these connections that are made and by, by the time they get to adolescence, um, some of the experiences that they don't have repeated get pruned off. Um, but the bulk of a child's brain growth and development happens in that first five years and we use that concept um, to encourage parents to provide rich um, sensory experiences for their kids in those first five years and to remember that these are kind of the, the pathways that are going to continue with them for life. What we do with the Family Engagement Program, um, we focus in Pima County. Um, most of our classes are online right now, um, but in real life, we usually uh, teach uh, classes for parents um, throughout the county in places like Head Starts. And um, we do it in our office, which is uh, right by the Tucson Village Farm, if anyone's ever been up there um, at the corner of Campbell and the Rito. Um, we teach classes in um, libraries and elementary schools and um, we also have a particular focus on teaching classes in the prison, the state and federal prisons on Wilmot. And we, so we have a particular focus on working with incarcerated communities. And we also have a focus on working with families with children with special needs. Um, there are a lot of considerations to be made and adaptations to be made to curricula that are focused on say positive discipline, for example, um, that are special to incarcerated parents and the situations that they face, um, and also to working with um, families with children with special needs. Um, so I, if anybody's interested in those areas, I'd be happy to talk more with you about um, those particular, particular focus areas. Um, we are um, in conversations about trying to adapt um, one of our curricula to working with um, incarcerated communities. Um, so that would be a possible um, publishing opportunity. And all of our classes are, um, are offered bilingually, um, English and Spanish, uh, wherever, um, wherever we teach them. And we also have another curricula that uses a child behavior management concept to help adults get along better. 
Um, so getting along is not just important for children, but it is for adults as well. So this is a special um, training that we do for people to improve their workplace climate and culture. So one of the classes that we have, I just wanted to kind of pull an excerpt from it because we do a lot of wonky wonk talk about what um, our research is and kind of the, um, the goals and objectives and outcomes of our work. But positive discipline is based on the work of a social psychologist named Alfred Adler, who believed that people belong, um, feel better when they experience a sense of belonging and that children behave better when they feel like they fit in. Um, and so a lot of the, um, activities around that class focus on that kind of concept. One of those activities is called the two lists. And it's a, a beautiful activity where you list all of the problems, behavior problems that you experience with kids. Maybe they're fighting or they don't listen or they won't sit down or um, they can't be patient or um, any of the issues that you're having with your kids. We get, we get the participants in the class to list all of those. And then we list, and a second um, list is, what do you hope for your child? What kind of human being do you want this child to be as an adult? And we create a linkage between those two that says, you know, if they're fighting, this is an opportunity to teach them about sharing. Or if they're not patient, this is an opportunity to give them some steps to help them to kind of learn how to plan and things like that so that they can be a planner um, and to have self-regulation. And so it really uses discipline as a tool for teaching rather than punishment. Some of the data that we've received with the help of um, Michelle Walsh and um, Madeline Dubois who are on this um, Zoom uh, in the CRED team um, have helped us to analyze. Uh, we have a, um, a research um, assessment called the AAPI, Adult Adolescent Parenting Inventory, that has shown us all of these improvements in parental empathy towards children, um, decreased spanking, and appropriate assignment of family and child roles. So we're very excited about these results. Other um, results that we've seen in working with the um, prison community is that um, of the families who have taken our, of the inmates who have taken our classes, one year after they are released from prison, they only have a 7% recidivism rate um, as compared to 27% in the general population. Um, finally, I just wanted to highlight that we have a very cool project going on um, with a film called Resilience, which focuses on adverse childhood experiences. And we have some um, community change projects going on where we want to work with the community to try and address um, some issues to mitigate the effects of ACEs in Pima County. Um, this is my information and I will put my um, email in the chat. Thank you so much. All right, hello everyone. My name is Thomas and I, I am an assistant professor in the personal and family financial planning program. My research focuses on household financial decisions and how it influences the well-being of households and individuals. Um, just last um, so I had the opportunity to present one of my papers on um, the role of financial advice in promoting college savings among households. In this paper, we use data set from um, US FINRA, and we all know that college education is important. However, it must be paid for. And one of the ways of doing that is through college savings. What we do know in the US is that more than half of households do not save for their children's college education. So what this paper sought to do is to find out the impact that financial advisors um, could make in encouraging households to save for college education. Um, I tried to be an engaged scholar. And so I tried to also share my research findings with the community. Um, this is a publication in the conversation. And we all know that in the US, there are some parents that decide to take out student loans for their children's education. 
And we know parents do this because they care about their children. And what this paper sought to do using data from the US Federal Reserve is to find out how that decision, the decision to take a loan for a child could have on your financial well-being. And this paper, uh, this project, it's so interesting. Um, this is about time use, how Americans use their time. Um, this one in particular is focusing on managing household finances and the effect on people's experiential well-being. So this is data from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, essentially what happens here is that people um, record the amount of time they spend engaged in household finances and how they feel as they engage in this activity. Is the activity meaningful? Are they happy? Is it painful, stressfulness, sad, or do they feel tired? So this paper gives us deeper insights into how Americans feel um, managing their finances. Then I have this paper that I'm, I'm working on with um, Melissa Kuman, and we are grateful to um, take charge for sponsoring this project. This paper is looking at, or this project is examining the factors that influence um, student loan indebtedness in retirement. You all know that retirement is a time for people um, to enjoy their wealth, not to be spending uh, money paying student loans. And so we try to find out what are, the, what are the various factors that makes people decide to use student loans although they are in retirement. So here we are examining financial literacy, we are examining spending behavior, we are examining their, um, um, their subjective, subjective um, financial knowledge and several other factors. Then Melissa and I are also examining um, this subject, but focusing more on Blacks. And this is an intra analysis, trying to understand more why Black households are more likely to have student loans in retirement. That is all that I have, and I want to say thank you for your time. Thanks, Thomas. All right, give me a minute to switch. It always takes me a minute, right? So I'm Melissa Curran, perfect transition. Thank you so much, Thomas. So here is my PowerPoint, which am I sharing this? Uh, yes, yes, you can see? Yes. Okay, thanks, Debbie. I know I always need a lot of help to make sure I'm, I'm sharing this correctly, so I appreciate your help. Okay, swell. Okay, perfect. Yeah, Debbie? Okay. Okay. So yeah. I'm Melissa Curran, as introduced by Thomas. Thank you so much. So so excited that you all are here. Thanks a million percent. So um, I will go through my research interests. So most generally, I study couple couple and family relationships, and then more specifically, the transition of parenthood for couples and families, attachment and relationship quality, the super interesting concept called relational sacrifices and relationship quality, things like commitment, satisfaction for couples. Um, and there's some cool statistical things you can do here, these actor partner interdependence models, these APIMs with diary data. And diary data is not like journaling, but like every day for like, you know, seven days or 10 days or 14 days, you answer some brief questions. And then as Thomas alluded to, I also study finances and relationships. So I'll just briefly talk about these first three. Um, and so there's a wonderful data set that we have access to where I, I love this data set. It's one of my favorite data sets. It's called the Building Strong Families data set. There's 5,000 couples at baseline, amazing and incredible. Most folks are lower income, all are unmarried, all are expecting their first child together. It's longitudinal data, three waves of time, uh, three kinds of measurement, couple level measurement, super interesting constructs, things like destructive conflict, constructive conflict, support and deflection, conflict, IPV, which stands for intimate partner violence, infidelity, so great, such great data. And we've been able to use these data in really interesting ways. So for example, because of such a large sample size, we've, been done, we've, been, um, we've done some pretty cool person-centered approaches. So things like creating classes or creating profiles, right? So um, Shami Lee, who was one of our great former graduate students, who's now faculty in Hong Kong, she has a, a great publication using these data. We also have another really, this is probably my favorite paper right now, a cross-logged analysis in terms of like establishing temporal ordering, like what comes first, kind of like the A versus B associations. I love this paper. It's one of my favorite papers. So it's kind of like a lab paper. It's with previous students, current students, as well as Melissa Barnett. 
And then we can also use these really great data to test questions of like replicability. So like if we've done, for example, some like financial and relationship quality and other samples, like do those same patterns um, play out if using a sample like building strong families? And the answer, of course, is always, it depends, right? Okay, so those are our, our transition to parenthood data. And so um, Mahak is here, who's applying from Bryn Mawr. I'm so excited we're gonna talk next. And so in her application, she wrote, it would be interesting to parse the unique contributions of couple level attachment style and the individual attachment styles of each partner in relation to quality. Great news, we have a paper on that exact topic. So I'll show that to you. So this is what it looks like, just the conceptual model. I didn't put in the data, but I love this paper so much. So this is again by a former graduate student, Shami and Lee and colleagues. And it's about couple level attachment, finances, marital satisfaction. And it's with great data on young adult newlywed couples. I love these data too. So they're from a project called CREATE from Brigham Young University in Utah, great colleagues. And so from this data set, there were um, about 1,100 young adult newlywed couples, so couples, so data from uh, both partners. And they've collected data now up to week five with the same, the same couples over time, some attrition, of course. And they also collected data during COVID. So it's such a great data set. And they're so great about sharing the data. I love these data so much. OK, and then love these data, too. So this is about relational sacrifices and relationship quality. And just super quickly about this picture, I, I typed in like couples and calendar, and I found this picture. And then every other picture was February 14th. So I guess if you're interested in dates and couples, <laughs> At least in the United States, I guess only February 14 shows up, which is kind of funny. So anyway, um, so these like relational sacrifices, which are basically like conflicts of interest that you have with your, you know, your intimate romantic partner. What do you decide to do? Do you transform your motives and sacrifice for them to hopefully improve the relationship? Does the relationship improve? For whom is it improved? Does it depend on who's sacrificing and what kind of motives they have? Such interesting questions. So we've done these after partner and defense models with these daily diary data. We've had great um, data sets with different sex couples with seven to 14 days of data. And this is actually the same person. This was the former visiting scholar from Bushra. So this is before, this is after she got married <laughs> and then before she got married, but we worked with her and great collaborators. And then we're so fortunate to have collaborators who've collected um, great data, again, on relational sacrifices and relationship quality with same sex couples. So the data are from Arizona and then Alabama um, at KC Totenhagen and Ashley Brandel, two former FSHD graduate students. And so we've had a great collaboration with them using these data. And so say you're like, oh, this is great, but I would like to collect my own data. Great news. We've done that as well. So it's this Chris Seeger and Technique, who's our great colleague here at the U of A in communication. So what we've done is we've asked undergraduate students and their partner to take surveys, like again, very often like diary surveys, or to have them ask their friends, their roommates, their parents, and then we offer extra credit. There's almost no cost to doing this. You have to plan ahead a couple semesters, but we have done a great job of this in communication, myself, as well as Emily Butler who's on the call today. IRB has at least historically been pretty friendly to this. It's pretty great. And our output has been really excellent. Like Casey Totenhagen, who's my first advisee, she had her, all of her dissertation papers published in really good journals, Journal of Family Psychology, Journal of Social and Personal Relationships. So it's, it's a great way um, to collect data and ask questions you're interested in. Okay, and that's it. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time today. And I am sharing now. Yes. Excellent, thank you. So I'm Elisa Delgado. I go by she, her, ella pronouns, and I'm Associate Professor in Family Studies and Human Development. In my presentation today, I wanna to walk you through two of my current projects that focus on the sociocultural processes of Latinx youth's educational experiences and their designs. This work focuses on using mixed methods approaches to examining Latinx students' sociocultural processes in two key ways, at the individual level and at the school level. These are, approaches are grounded in strengths-based perspectives, such as the risk and resilience frameworks, which focus on positive contextual, social, and individual level factors that interfere or disrupt developmental trajectories from risk to poor mental health and or um, poor behavioral outcomes, such as academic performance or achievement. 
And this work is also rooted in cultural ecological models, such as the integrative model, which suggests that individual social positions within the US, such as race or ethnicity, are linked to unique experiences. For example, the ethnic and racial discrimination that minoritized youth experience in the US, and in turn, that these experiences shape adolescent development or um, adolescent adjustment. Additionally, the integrative model suggests that the context in which youth develop can be promotive, inhibitive, or maybe even both. In my goal to address the academic disparities of Latinx youth and that they experience here in the US, I use qualitative and quantitative data across two states in the Southwest to A, explore how Latinx youth, a majority of whom are Mexican origin in my sample, come to identify with math and science as part of their academic identities, and B, to examine how academic identity matters for their academic outcomes. To this end, in one of my projects, I employed an explanatory sequential mixed methods research design with the goal to adapt or create a new academic identity measure for Latinx adolescents. In the first phase of the study, I collected survey data from 282 middle school teens on an academic identity measure that had been developed for college students. And in the second phase, I collected focus group data from 46 of the 282 participating teens. Um, and then these data helped explain what was missing or um, what was um, not relevant and also added meaning meaning behind the items that we used. And then in a third phase, we collected survey data using a new sample of 200 middle school teens to test the psychometric properties of the new measure and happy to say that we found a reliable and valid measure. However, much of the work addressing academic disparities, including my own, tends to focus on the focus tends to put place the onus or the responsibility of reducing disparities on the youth and their families or on those individuals experiencing ethnic racial discrimination and systems of oppression. And certainly we want youth and families to draw from their strengths um, such as helpful academic identities. Equally important, however, is to address how institutions of power such as schools can function as risk reducers and or as protective factors. So to this end, my research team and I collected focus group data to hear from Latinx middle school students about their positive and negative experiences at school with peers, teachers, and administrators. This work led us to construct a new measure we are calling sociocultural school climate. And this measure captures experiences with overt racism, more subtle racism like microaggressions, and cultural school experiences. And then in a second phase of the study, we collect survey data to examine the psychometric properties of this measure, again, finding a reliable and valid measure. Um, overall, this work um, or next steps of this work, here I'm just presenting the design of these two um, studies and our goals there, uh, but my key collaborator and I are currently designing an intervention study that incorporates both academic identity and sociocultural school climate to address academic disparities, but also the inequality Latinx students experience in US schools. What I um, takeaways from this work is that it allows us, using these mixed methods, research designs allow us to more holistically understand that Latinx youth have high levels of math and science academic identities, that these identities are being fostered at home and at school, and that they do matter for academic outcomes. We also find overall in this work that culture is salient and students' sociocultural experiences matter. And thus schools also matter um, as key socializing agents of these youth. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, 
Michelle Walsh was invited to present today, but she is away at a workshop, so I will be introducing you all to CRED. Um, I am a member and Michelle Walsh leads the CRED team. It is a nine person strong community research evaluation and development team. We are a highly collaborative group of research and evaluation professionals from diverse academic backgrounds who bring this range of perspectives to the applied and community based work that we do. So rather than being focused on a particular content area, our goal is to put social science to work in informing decision making and solving social problems. We do that by working through these three guiding principles. And these are some of our partners in the portfolio of on campus and broader community partnerships that we engage in. I'll highlight a few of the projects today, but wanted you to know that these partnerships are much more wide ranging than what I have time to get through today. So one important cornerstone of our work is our partnership with Cooperative Extension. Our work with Extension has focused on building capacity by making sure that faculty and staff have the tools and training they need to develop and implement effective programming. So one of the example um, is this tool that we've developed for the SNAP Nutrition Education and Obesity Prevention Grant Program, commonly known as SNAP-ED. The goal of our project here was to port, support SNAP-ED in developing a data-informed approach to selecting which communities they wanted to work in and what work would be best serve those communities. So we compiled a lot of data into online interactive maps. The underlaid map here, for example, is WIC retailers and the proportion of children on SNAP by census tract in the Tucson area. We'll hopefully be getting to update these maps this summer, so that project is on the docket. Uh, and then we conducted data workshops with folks across 12 counties in Arizona so they'd understand how to use the tools to inform their programming. We trained them in the map use and facilitated discussions on where they'd like to see their programming efforts and future efforts around policy systems and environmental work be focused. We then distilled those conversations and insights from the data into briefs for each county that would help them shape their programming for the next five years. Um, SNAP had then approached us again to continue to support their work around community engagement. To that end, we produced a series of eight training videos to support the SNAP Ed, SNAP -ED staff in their meaningful work with their communities um, based on IAP2's spectrum of public participation. Another of our key partners is the state's Early Childhood Health and Development Board called First Things First. We've worked with First Things First on a number of statewide and more localized reports over the last decade. This map shows the regions we've partnered with across the state in this process. These community assessments use secondary and sometimes primary data to give a snapshot of the region across a number of important indicators related to young children and their families. The reports are used by the First Things First Regional Councils to make decisions on where to direct about $125 million a year of funding um, towards early childhood program and policies, as well as community agencies who seek to understand the needs and assets in the regions they serve. Our familiarity with so much of the data around early years uh, has led to other work in this area. So in a white paper for MAP dashboard, we identified areas in the greater Tucson community that are child care deserts, which is a term for when there are at least three times as many children as there are child care spots. And in that paper, we look not only at geographic accessibility, but also financial accessibility. And that work fed directly into two policy briefs we produced for the Women's Foundation of Arizona, uh, one illustrating the importance of two generation programs and the, the other looking at mid skill high wage careers um, and strategic supports that could be used to help women launch into those fields. And so this is some of that policy relevant work that really gets us excited. Uh, those two research briefs in turn um, sparked a new program led by the Women's Foundation called the Pathways Program. It's designed to serve single moms and support them um, by covering tuition and a stipend and childcare in pursuing a one-year certificate program at Pima Community College in a specific set of fields where someone graduating would expect to earn a living wage. So we are the research and evaluation partners on this project, um, and it's been an especially interesting rollout since it kicked off in January 2020, also known as right before the pandemic flipped everything on its head. Uh, so here we've been emphasizing a developmental evaluation process, really working hand in hand with the Women's Foundation and their partners at Pima Community College and Arizona at Work to document how that pilot has evolved. We are surveying students at multiple points during their classes and planning for surveys 18 months out post completion, um, as well as conducting interviews both with participants and program partners. And then while we were in pandemic, we also uh, took our very real lived experiences, plus this professional interest in childcare and working families to um, lead a university wide study of stressors of caregiving for those working or studying at U of A during the pandemic. 
Uh, we got responses from about one third of all faculty and staff across the U of A umbrella, both here in Tucson and Phoenix and more broadly, um, meaning that we have short surveys from about 4,500 employees and students. And then we did longer surveys with caregivers uh, and conducted 40 interviews uh, for a cross section of experiences as well. Um, we saw that as you might expect, there is a pretty um, widespread of stress ranging from those not caregiving at the lowest end to the sandwich generation caregivers at the top end, meaning those that are caring both for their children and then aging parents. Um, we also documented that massive shift in caregiving. So uh, going from most people using some sort of outside of their family care pre-pandemic to uh, less than, you know, or about a third of that afterwards. There's a ton of good qualitative and quantitative data still to be worked with here if this is interesting to you. Um, and then finally, we have a number of students who are working with data we've collected in a pilot evaluation of the Ben Spence Penn Campus Program. Uh, this is a local nonprofit that has a kindness education program for schools. We've been their research partner for a lot of years and have about 3,000 student surveys and 200 teacher surveys along with observational data and interview data there as well. So that's the Fast and Furious take on a handful of our projects um, and our contact information is here. Please feel free to reach out with questions. Thank you. All right. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Kate Spears. I'm an assistant professor in family studies and human development and an extension specialist in early childhood. And the overall aim of my work is to produce high quality research and extension programming that promotes school readiness for Arizona's young children. My work tends to focus in these two areas um, because there's demonstrated need in these areas among Arizona's young children. Um, I also tend to focus on early care and education as I have an interest in those settings. Um, so I'm going to take you through some of the projects that I'm currently working on. Um, the first is an extension program designed to promote early literacy. The project is being delivered um, in two American Indian communities that share geography with Arizona, um, part of the Navajo Nation and the San Carlos Apache tribal lands. And I'm collaborating with um, part of the CRED team that you were just introduced to on this project. Um, we've worked hard to develop this programming in collaboration with the communities that we're serving. Um, one way that we're doing this is by partnering with local community advisory boards. Um, we've also worked to develop some of our program content with uh, local community-based organizations, and we've tried to do that in a way that is mutually beneficial both to our program and their organization. So this program has seven components. Um, we wanted to give people in the community a wide variety of ways to be involved with this program or to participate in the program because we knew from previous work in these communities um, that not everyone would be able to attend, attend multi-session classes. So the first two components are handouts and videos that are available for viewing and download from our website. Um, the next three are one-time events for families with young children and childcare providers. And the last two, these are our multi-session programs, one for families and one for childcare providers. Um, we are currently in the process, I was just working on this um, on Wednesday, uh, so we're currently in the process of requesting tribal permission to collect evaluation data, so we have not yet been able to rigorously evaluate this program, um, but we have received encouraging feedback for most of these um, components that we've already started. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of that um, for one of our most recent events. Um, at the end of January, we held a professional development session for child care providers. Um, the focus was on um, children's books that are either by Native authors or um, celebrate uh, Native people and cultures. And um, we put together a session that included a children's book author and an educator from the communities um, and a book sharing session where participants shared books with each other. Um, each other. Um, we had 69 people attend and um, the feedback that we received said that they found the workshop to be worth their time, useful and provided information that would be hard to get elsewhere. Um, when we asked them what the most useful part of the workshop was, respondents reported that they appreciated learning about new children's books and the focus on Native authors and books about Native communities. Um, another program that I'm working on with Hope Wilson 
who is the um, extension agent in um, Yavapai County, uh, is seed to read. Um, this is an early literacy and nutrition education program. Um, we're currently applying to have it included in the SNAP-Ed toolkit, which will allow it to be delivered using SNAP-Ed funding, both in Arizona and nationally. And we have an evaluation study plan for next fall. Um, I'm also working with a work group of extension faculty from seven states to put together a national inventory of extension programming that will document if and how cooperative extension systems provide programming for the EC workforce and engage with EC state systems. Um, last spring, we fielded an online survey where representatives from about half of the cooperative extension systems across the country responded. We asked about the five areas that you can see on the screen. Um, and we're working on a report to summarize our findings. And we have a paper under review that looks at um, programming related to the COVID pandemic. So I'm gonna take you through um, just a few findings from that work. Um, so as you might imagine, not surprisingly, we found that cooperative extension systems across the country reported that they were providing programming designed to help EC professionals respond to the pandemic. Um, this programming was also primarily offered online, also not surprising. Um, and um, interestingly, when we asked um, how they were making decisions about this programming, most were using informal needs assessment methods, as you can see in the red square on the screen. Um, this is likely because these informal approaches can be quickly and inexpensively implemented and allow um, cooperative extension systems to begin providing support and programming um, without overburdening EC professionals or families with young children, two groups that we know were significantly impacted by the pandemic. Um, but we cautioned um, that as we move forward, um, these informal methods should be replaced with systematic data collection. Um, and then I had two other programs that I was gonna quickly go through, but I, it looks like my time is up, so I will skip those, but um, I am available to talk about them and any of my other work. And here's my contact information, feel free to reach out, thanks. So our last presenter is Dr. Emily Butler and she's unable to join us today, but she has provided a video recording of her presentation, which we will watch now. I'm Emily Butler, and I'm a professor in Family Studies and Human Development, and my students and collaborators and I together form the Temporal Interpersonal Emotion Systems, or TIES, research group. And I'll try to unpack for you as we go what the heck that means. So one of the really well-established facts in social science is that the quantity and quality of our social relationships predicts every aspect of our lives, our health, our well-being, our performance in our jobs and across contexts. So the million dollar question is, how is it that our social relationships have all these far reaching effects on the quality of our lives? Now, there's a lot of possible answers to that. Our group focuses on the idea of emotion. And when I say emotions, I don't mean just how you're feeling. When you get angry, there's a strong biological piece. Your blood pressure goes up, for example. There's behavioral pieces. You start frowning and stomping your feet and maybe go grab a beer to try to make yourself feel better. There's cognitive pieces. You start seeing other people as hostile and start thinking up ways to get back at them and so on. So emotions have these multiple components, all of which could connect to all kinds of outcomes in life. There's the direct biological, say blood pressure going up, but there's the behavioral, alienating people by being mean to them or having going and grabbing a drink and having a beer to make yourself feel better. So our emotions are embedded in our social relationships and they have all these different complex ways that they can affect all of the possible outcomes in our lives. So there's a lot of complexity here. So in order to study this, we think in terms of these temporal or over time, interpersonal, so social, emotional systems, sort of like a dynamic system. So this is my fried egg diagram of a temporal interpersonal emotion system. And the top row of circles is one person going through some emotional episode with the circles inside that being the different components. So this might be their biology and their experience and their behavior interacting to get them really riled up and angry and then eventually to come down and calm down again. But whatever is going on for that first person in this dynamic process is directly influencing the people around them. 
So my bi behavior is getting connected up with my partner's behavior, my biology is getting influenced by theirs, and so on. So we get this complex system evolving over time due to these emotional processes in both people. So to study this, we need data and we need mathematical models. So the most common data for us are like things like biological measures in the lab while people are having a conversation. So something like heart rate over time or self-reported experiences day to day, say over several weeks. And so these three pictures show actual data from couples in the lab, three different heterosexual couples having a conversation in the lab. And this is what they reported feeling during the interaction. And so higher values are more positive, low values are negative. And we can see from visually from these three real examples that couples do get into these different emotional patterns where they're connected with each other. This first couple is sort of escalating more and more positive as the interaction goes on in tandem with each other. The second couple is sort of oscillating around, but very much in sync with each other. When one person's happy, so is the other one. This last couple, though, is doing the exact opposite. When one person's feeling more positive, the other's feeling negative, and vice versa. And they're this kind of counterbalancing system. So we spend a lot of time getting various kinds of data to assess these different patterns of interpersonal connections. And we think in terms of different mathematical models, this is actually the equation for a coupled oscillator model or an oscillator model, don't worry about it. But this essentially allows us to ask statistically whether these different kinds of patterns are actually predictive of different kinds of outcomes that are good or bad for individuals or couples. So we've got a variety of different projects on the go at any given time. Right now, here's three of the big ones. Uh, we have one study going on with collaborators at UC Berkeley, looking at these different emotional components within a person and saying, is it good or bad to be the kind of person that when your heart rate goes up, your emotion goes up too? Or would it be better to have those uncoupled in a way that kind of counter-regulate? And we don't know. We're collecting the data and starting to use different models of this within person emotional coherence and connecting it up to various measures of well being. We have another study going on with collaborators in Israel, a clinical study in this case, where we're looking at romantic couples who are distressed at the beginning going through couples therapy and asking whether the therapy can actually change the, the biological interconnections between the partners. And if so, does that become provide a mechanism for actually improving their relationship? Finally, we have a wild and crazy project in collaboration with computer scientists where we're seeing if we can develop a socially intelligent artificial agent that could actually help human teams in, in various teamwork situations function better as a human team. And as part of that, we're, we've set up a lab where we're able to measure multiple people's brains simultaneously and start looking at the way that people's brains become interconnected in a teamwork setting and the various things that predict good ways of getting interconnected versus less constructive ways. And with that, I'll wrap up and say many, many thanks to my collaborators and my funders. And if you have any questions or comments, my email's there at the bottom and please do get in touch. And thank you very much. Okay, so we do, everyone thanks. So thank you so much to all of our presenters and everyone stuck to the time limit, which is fantastic. So we do have some time left for um, questions and answers. So if anyone attending has questions for general questions or for any of the specific presenters, you can either raise your hand or use the, the Q&A function in Zoom. It's a lot of information to absorb. <laughs> it's the hardest part of giving people time to think. And if you do want to get, we will have this recording posted um, on our website and on our YouTube page sometime early next week. So if you want to go back um, and look at any of these, please, um, I think everyone who came to present here today, I'm going to speak on behalf of all of you. We are happy to have undergraduate and graduate students um, contact us. So um, we would be happy to, to find ways to, to work with you. So if you don't have any questions again, thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you. Special thanks to Sakua Wong who helped organize all of this. Um, we really appreciate you joining us. And this has been fun. I'd, I'd love to hear about all of the work that you all are doing.
Thanks. Thanks all. Thank you, Melissa.